Southern California, good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. We have ourselves a jam-packed show as we have quite a bit to get into, such as some not-so-good news for the Chargers. What is this not-so-good news for the Chargers, and is this a start of possible unfortunate events for the Bolt Brigade? Also, the Rams got into a little bit of a scuffle with the Bengals in a joint practice. What happened and who were the leading suspects and how about wave fc finally getting back on track and winning over the houston dash which was crucial for them now they face the portland thorns can they top the thorns and also the angels are up for sale finally art moreno is going to sell the team where will they be going and will art sell the team to a actual owner who decides the possible fate of the Angels. We have all that and more here on the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all the sports. Welcome one, welcome all to another edition of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Thank you all for joining me on this beautiful Friday afternoon, Friday evening, Friday, wherever you are listening from. Either way, you have made yourself into episode 100 of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show with me, Taryn Rodriguez, on IE Sports Radio. And without any further delay, let's get this party started. But first and foremost, IE Sports Radio would not be where it's at without the help of iSports Radio. iSports Radio is available on several different social media platforms, such as Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at iSports Radio. And they're also available on Facebook by typing in the word IE, then sports, then radio. They also have a website, www.iesportsradio.com. And if you go there, you'll see a Patreon link, which starts at $5 a month. This will get you a shout from every show on iSports Radio. Every show. And other tiers include iSports Radio merchandise, access to ISRU, the podcasting university of iSports Radio, and even a chance to be featured on our flagship show, The Defining Moment, with the one, the only, Larry B. Thank you all so much for all of your support and for help making iSports Radio your direct feed for all of that sports. Shout out to our Patreon supporters, Bay Area Race Apparel, Marcus Los Great, Key to the Gate, and a donor that wishes to remain anonymous. We appreciate all of your support, and we appreciate everyone that is spreading the word about us. And without any further delay, let's get started. First, we're going to start off with some volleyball, if I were running set point at this time. So, as we all know, NCAA volleyball season on the women's side is back, as I don't like bringing up volleyball when it comes to this show, but I have to make this known. The University of San Diego, number 25 San Diego, upset Number six pit in five sets at Texas A&M. So if you all do listen to Set Point, I was a little critical of of the Toreros. I basically said on my show that they need to prove themselves that they are top twenty five material, and I just wasn't really sold on them as basically 
the Toreros proved me wrong, and they made me eat my word. So, hats off to the Toreros. They are a small school, but just because they are a small school does not mean they can't do big things. As I'm actually watching some volleyball in the background, Texas is playing Ohio State at Columbus on FS1, for those that are interested. But we're not going to talk a whole lot about volleyball. We are going to dive more into SoCal sports. And I guess I'll make note that Long Beach State, my alma mater, beat Oregon State in five. They were down 2 nothing, and then they managed to reverse sweep them, earning the first victory in the Tyler Hildebrand era. So... That's basically that for the volleyball portion of the show. It was brief, and it's basically those schools as USC, UCLA, and all the other schools probably are getting their season underway, except later. Like, UCLA gets their season off momentarily, probably at like 7-ish. Same with USC. USC isn't really playing anybody of noteworthiness. They're playing like Colgate, UMBC, and I think Villanova. If they're not 3-0 by the end of this weekend, we got to relegate them. <laughs> and same can be said for UCLA. They're playing Utah State and Cal Poly. Cal Poly is a little good. I think Cal Poly is talented, but I'm sure they're going to handle Utah State. They can't. UCLA can't lose to Cal Poly. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to diss Cal Poly, but I just think UCLA always has the better recruits. They got good transfer players and whatnot. All right, now we move on from volleyball. (laughs) So now we move on to the NFL. So unfortunately for the Chargers, they had some bad news this week. They found out that J.C. Jackson, their new cornerback that signed from the New England Patriots, is going to need ankle surgery, or he had ankle surgery, and he's going to miss two to four weeks. So there is the possibility he could be out for the season opener It's looking like it, but there is a possibility that he could be back in time for the season opener. So it's nothing to be ultimately alarmed at. I think it could have been a whole lot worse than two to four weeks. I think he'll be back by at least week two because he's going to miss this week. He's obviously going to miss the game against the Saints, which he wasn't even probably going to play. And then he's also going to miss probably the remaining days of training camp, which is next week. And then the Raiders game is on September 11th. He should be back by then, if that is the possibility. But if not, he should be back by week two. If that is the case of J.C. Jackson being out by week one, the Chargers still have other options at cornerback. They have Michael Davis, they have Asante Samuel Jr., and they have Bryce Callahan, who they signed from the Denver Broncos. Now, Bryce Callahan might be the most underrated signing for the Chargers since J.C. Jackson got, I wouldn't say hurt, but he was basically, he was playing with a hurt ankle and he needed surgery. So, yeah. So, I think it's good that we could see Bryce Callahan and Michael Davis and Asante Samuel Jr. Like, there was probably going to be one odd man out with Jackson in the fold. But I think it's going to be great to see Bryce Callahan shine. And Bryce Callahan can still play even at age 30. I think he's certainly better than Chris Harris Jr. Like, that dude has been cooked ever since the Broncos won the Super Bowl. And don't get me started on that. Just don't get me started. Okay, but anyway, um, other injuries that occurred with the Chargers is that Isaiah Spiller is week to week, but I imagine he could be back by the Chargers season opener. And then Joshua Kelly, or not Joshua Kelly, Joshua Palmer has cleared concussion protocols and he was back doing individual dr- drills last yesterday. So... For me, I think it's good that we see Joshua Palmer. He is slated to be the wide receiver three, but Jalen Guyton's probably going to have something to say about that just because Guyton runs great routes, and he's super fast. And he was a very good, reliable wide receiver three for the Chargers last season. So I was going to I did mention a little bit of Joshua Kelly, even though I mixed his name up with Joshua Palmer. So Joshua Kelly looks like the clear running back too. I promise you, if he fumbles one more time, I'm going to lose it. This dude gets one last chance to win me over. 
And if this dude fumbles or he does something really, really clumsy, I'm never forgiving this man. I'm going to have him fumble his way back to UCLA. That's just how much I can't take Joshua Kelly. But apparently he's improved. Apparently he's got his swagger back. But I want to see it actually in a game. So what I'm also curious is I'm wondering if the Chargers could sign Kenyon Drake. Kenyon Drake is still in his late 20s, and I think he'd be a good running back, too, for the Chargers. I get it. The Chargers have a loaded running back room, but it's not really, like, loaded. It's, like, quantity loaded. They have Joshua Kelly, Larry Roundtree, and Isaiah Spiller. Spiller has been a great addition I mean, the Chargers drafted him in the third round, or was it the fourth? Either way, they drafted him in the third round, and they have to utilize that to their advantage. Otherwise, that will be the biggest waste of a third-round pick. So, so I feel that is the case for the Chargers running back room. I would like to see Kenyon Drake come back to the Chargers, because he just was released by the Las Vegas Raiders, the Chargers' Week 1 opponent. And I think it would only be fair if the Chargers kind of signed someone from the Raiders, kind of like how the Raiders were signing all of the other char- former Chargers players, like Casey Hayward and Tyron Johnson. I'm still not going to let that Tyron Johnson signing go. The Chargers should have never let him go. But it's all good. <laughs> so I just would like to see... I'd like to see Kenyon Drake on the Chargers. Yes, he just came off of ankle injury or ankle surgery, but I think it would be a good addition. I mean, the Chargers kind of have been whiffing on other possible running back to op- opportunity signings, but I think for me, signing Kenyon Drake would be great. It gives him a lot more experience and depth, just because experience is so key. And between Isaiah Spiller and Joshua Kelly and... Larry Roundtree, they only have like three years under their belt, which is not a good recipe for success. So, either way, if the Chargers do sign Kenyon Drake, awesome, but if they don't, then in Joshua Kelly we trust, and that's going to be something I don't want to see. Not too much. That'll do it for the Chargers portion of the show. Jumping over to the Rams, so... The Rams... Oh, I, oh, wait, 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 wait. I forgot to mention the Chargers are playing the Saints in preseason. I want to say it's tonight. I think it's tonight. I'm not entirely... Oh, yes, it is tonight. And the Saints are up 7 nothing on the Chargers in preseason, but it's preseason. You all are not going to make me react to a preseason game. You all are not going to make me fully care about it. Preseason to me is just basically the final dress rehearsal and the players who make the cut for the team for the final 53 man roster. So I really think that I, 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 what I'm trying to say is if the chargers lose, it's not going to rattle me. Like I really don't think it's going to frustrate me. It's not going to make me cry or anything like no one's going to make me care for this preseason game. Nobody. Now jumping over to the Rams. So the Rams close out preseason play against the Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati. And here's the thing. The Rams and the Bengals obviously met in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 56, and then they had a joint practice. What I kind of wonder is this. Why would they have a joint practice between the two teams that made the Super Bowl last year? I understand because... Well, obviously the two teams are facing one another in preseason, but it's like they're both fresh off of making the Super Bowl. Are they? Is there really going to be bad blood? Of course there is. There was a bit of a brawl that happened, and apparently Aaron Donald was swinging his helmet. I don't know if Aaron Donald will be punished, but it. I don't know. I mean, it was in practice, and basically when this was, this wasn't. It wasn't like the whole Miles Garrett situation with the Cleveland Browns, but honestly, he still probably shouldn't have done that. Like, it wasn't really the smartest decision. I mean, but still, 
I, I don't think a joint practice would be a good idea between the Bengals and the Rams, two teams that met in the Super Bowl. So I think for me, I don't. I understand something must have been said to like set Aaron Donald off, or something must have been done to set Aaron Donald off. So we'll see what happens when it comes to Aaron Donald and his punishment. But all in all, I... Larry B actually pops in the chat room. He he was active in the chat room early on. He said that the Bengals and the Rams aren't friends. Yeah, it doesn't look like they're friends. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't think the Bengals and Rams are going to be losing any love when it comes to this preseason game. And Larry B also put in the chat, he's he's the dum dum of the week and he's a Raiders fan. Nah, there's actually someone else who is the dum dum of the week. Don't worry about that, Larry B. You're not the dum dum. <laughs> so anyway, for the Rams, I don't think there has been any other news outside of well, this news happened a while ago. They lost one of their offensive tackles for the season, which was really bad. It was not fun for the Rams losing. I think his name is Joseph Notaboom. That is a huge bummer, but I'm sure the Rams will be resilient. What I don't see them doing is signing Andrew Whitworth to a one-year contract like they did with Eric Weddle. But for the Rams, I think they're going to I still think they're going to be in good shape. Yes, Matt Stafford might not have enough time to in the pocket, but I feel he'll I feel he'll be able to utilize what the offensive line gives him. I really think that the Rams are still going to be in good shape. My only concern for the Rams is kind of the running back room. Cam Akers does return. I mean, he didn't really play a full season because of AC an ACL tear or Achilles tear. But I feel he'll be I think he'll be a good option. I think with a full season now about to be on the horizon, I think Cam Akers is going to look really good, and I think he should be better than last year, for sure. And then Lance McCutcheon, I really think, is really coming along nicely for the Rams as a receiver. Do I think he's going to be a day-one starter? No. Do I think the Do I think he can make the roster? Absolutely. I think Lance McCut- Mc- McCutcheon is going to be great for the Rams, and I'm excited to see what he could bring to the table. I really hope he can do big things for the Rams. I think he was impressive against the Chargers, that's for sure. Like, he's no Cooper Cup, that is for sure, but I'm excited to see what Lance could do. So... Overall, I think it's going to be extremely fun for the Rams. I can't wait to see what they can bring to the table. I really think that the Rams could possibly repeat as could possibly repeat as Super Bowl champions. Everyone's saying they're not going to repeat or they're not going to make the playoffs. No. I think the Rams are going to make the playoffs even if it's like the wild card. If they don't win the AFC West, then I still have them making the wild card. So, overall, people need to put away the narrative of the Rams aren't going to do what they did last year. The Rams are going to be better, if not all. Well, they're going to be better, but they're going to be, like, much improved. Do I think that they're it's they're going to go undefeated? Of course not. That is, I wouldn't say humanly impossible, but... I still think it's doable. I just don't think it's going to happen just because losing always happens. And it wasn't Joseph Notaboom. It was actually Logan Bruss as he tore his ACL and MCL. And Daniel Hardy, who was was actually outside linebacker, sustained a high ankle sprain. So it wasn't Joseph Notaboom. It was Logan Bruss. So that still is a big blow to the Rams' offensive line. But I'm sure the Rams will be resilient. What I have been hearing is that the Raiders might be trading Alex Leatherwood, if who is basically one of the offensive linemen for the Raiders. Now I'm not going to fully confirm this, and I don't think it would be a good idea, just because the Raiders did draft him in the first round a couple seasons ago. He was in the same draft class as 
Rayshon Slater and Panay Sewell and all those other guys. But I'd be interested to see if the Rams do go after Alex Leatherwood. I'd hate to see a first-round pick from the Raiders get traded just because, well, it's another first-round pick wasted by the Raiders, but hey, what can you do? And then overall, for the Rams, like I said, I think I don't think they're going to be in too bad of a shape. I mean, obviously losing Bruss is a big blow to their offensive line. Matthew Stafford needs all the protection he can get, but... I think he is. Ju- I think he'll be fine. The Rams close out preseason play against the Bengals tomorrow, and it'll be at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So I'm excited to see what's in store for the Rams this season. They open up the season on Thursday night football against the Buffalo Bills. Everyone is previewing that as a possible Super Bowl like, preview, I think it's a little too early to call that a Super Bowl preview, just because a lot can happen in the season. I'm not trying to say the Bills aren't going to make the Super Bowl. I'm not going to try to say the the, the Rams are not going to make the Super Bowl. I just think a lot happens in a season, and anything is possible when it comes to teams making or missing the playoffs, if not the whole thing. So, Or not the whole thing, but the whole Super Bowl. But I think it's a little too early to say Super Bowl... preview, but one can only hope. So that's going to do it for the NFL portion of the show. The Rams, I guess I should go over the preseason scores from last week. So the Rams lost to the Houston Texans 24-20 while the Chargers got manhandled by the Dallas Cowboys and Honestly, I don't care if they lost. I don't care if the Chargers lost in preseason. I don't care if the Rams lost in preseason. All that matters is the regular season. This is just dress rehearsal. This is basically to see who is going to make the final 53-man roster. So don't try to like persuade me or trick me into thinking that preseason is what really matters. Because it doesn't. All right, so that's going to do it for the NFL portion of the show before I go ballistic. All right, let's jump to some MLB. We're going to jump to some MLB, and the Angels are possibly up for sale when it comes to them being sold by Art Moreno. Honestly, the Angels just need a much better owner in general. First of all, they shouldn't be known as the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. They should either be known as the Anaheim Angels or the Los Angeles Angels. I think the Anaheim Angels are a much better, has a much better ring to it. I just think it, it just rolls off the tongue easy. I just think Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim is just too much to basically say in one sentence. So that's my little spiel right there. As for the team being sold... Again, I'm happy that the the Angels might be being sold. I do not like Art Moreno personally. I think he hasn't really given Mike Trout and Shohei Otani the support that they need in order to make the playoffs, let alone get to a World Series run. I just think that it's been disappointing that Mike Trout is in his 10th plus year and unfortunately he just continues to just rot away with the angels i mean there have been there were like rumors saying that the angels might trade shohei otani but that was not the case as basically the ram or not the rams the angels just they keep finding ways to not win games and it's really sickening if you ask me but either way i think that the that the Angels will hopefully find someone competent to buy the Angels. I really just don't want to see more underachieving. It really sucks. I really hate seeing the Angels underachieve. I really want them to do good. I really want them to actually have success this season or in the up-and-coming seasons. So, eh. Here we go. There we go. For the Angels, they are currently up 7-0 against the Toronto Blue Jays, but they are on pace. I do want to say this. The Angels are on pace to having the worst season of their historical all-season career, or their worst season all-time. 
they just have to go 14 and 24 through in their last few games. If not, like much worse. I think it's like 14 and like 23 at this point. Ever since they lost to the Tampa Bay Rays last night. Speaking of the Tampa Bay Rays, the Angels got swept by the Tampa Bay Rays in a, in the four-game series most recently as they lost game one on Monday 2-1, to one, and then on Tuesday they lost 11-1. Wednesday they lost 4-3 to three in 11 innings, and then on Thursday they lost to the Rays 8-3, which closed the four-game sweep, which was absolutely disappointing. What's even worse is that the Angels lost 2-3 of three to the Tigers, which... In the first game, the Angels won one nothing. Which now the Angels are two and zero, or not two and zero. They have two wins when scoring one run, one run or less. It's a little cheesy of a stat, but hey, I like cheese. <laughs> and then the Angels lost the second game four to three and lost the final game of the series against Detroit four nothing. This was last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, as the Angels. Face the Toronto Blue Jays in a three-game series in Toronto. The Angels are currently up three nothing, or not three nothing, seven nothing. As it's quite astounding to see them up, considering the Blue Jays are vying for playoff positioning. And currently, where it stands, the Blue Jays, I want to say, are yeah, they're second in the wild card race, and they're basically fighting the Mariners. The Rays and the Orioles for a spot in the playoffs. So I'm interested to see how that's going to turn out. Obviously, the Angels aren't going to make the playoffs unless they go on a super-duper tear. But honestly, we'll see what happens. The Angels' schedule doesn't get much easier as after the three-game series against the Blue Jays, they have a three-game homestand against the New York Yankees on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they have a three-game homestand against the Houston Astros. So basically, this week is a gauntlet. Well, this week, including this weekend. So there's not going to be any rest for the weary, if you ask me. So, again, I just don't see the Angels making the playoffs. Like, even if they win out their remaining games, which I highly doubt happens, can they really make the playoffs? Can they really, like, keep up with, like, the Rays and the Blue Jays and the Mariners? Probably not. So that's going to do it for the Angels. Now for their older brother, which is actually having success, the Dodgers. They continue to win as they have a firm vice grip on the National, or the NL West, having a 19 and a half game lead on on the Padres, which is quite amazing, as currently the Dodgers lead one nothing over the Marlins in the top of the sixth. This past week, they took two out of three games against the Brewers. They lost the first game four nothing, but won the next two by scores of ten to one and twelve to six in the Chavez Ravine. Last weekend, the Dodgers swept the Miami Marlins, winning 2-1, 7-0, and 10-3 at the Chavez Ravine last Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So, for the Dodgers, they faced the Miami Marlins in a four-game series over the weekend, starting today and ending on Monday. That's kind of a rarity, if you ask me. And then the Angels have a three-game series against the New York Mets in the Big Apple on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, which is a huge series just because those two could possibly meet in the National League Championship. But it's too early to preview that. And then next Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the Dodgers are back home against the Padres, and it's kind of a little bit of a gauntlet. When it comes to that Mets series, following the Mets series and the Padres series, they have three-game series against the Giants, which are still hopeful for making the playoffs as a wild-card team. And then after that series against the Giants, the Dodgers are hitting the road to Petco Park to take on the Padres, which, looking at the standings for the wild card, the Dodgers need not worry about a wild card. They're not going to need to be a wild card team. The Dodgers are totally fine. As for the National League wild card, the Padres are somewhat locked. Well, not locked, but they're pretty much in third 
when it comes to that wild card spot. So they'd play the two, which I assume would be the Mets, which is probably going to be the Mets. Uh, as yeah, that would be the Mets, as they are seven and a half games back of the Dodgers. I think that'd be a good little thing for the Padres. I think it would be good for them to avoid the Dodgers at all costs until the National League Championship. I too would like to see the Dodgers and the Padres in the NL Championship. I think it would be good for Southern California, and it would be good for the NL West, and it would show the depth of the NL West. So, for the Padres, I'd like to see the Dodgers and the Padres in the NL West champ or the National League Championship. So, time will tell if that actually happens, though. Speaking of the Padres, they are one and a half games ahead of the Brewers in the wild card race, the final wild card race in the National League. As for the Padres themselves, it's kind of been a little bit of a roller coaster ride. They were recently swept by the Cleveland Guardians in a two game series, losing three to one on Tuesday and seven nothing on Wednesday. And then against the Nationals, they won two of three, winning or losing the first game six to three, then losing or no losing the first game six to three, and then winning the next two games by scores of two to one. Actually, they split their four-game series against the Nationals as they lost last Thursday's game 3-0, lost last Friday's game 6-3, and then they won by scores of 2-1 on Saturday and Sunday. So currently, the Padres are facing the Kansas City Royals in Kansas City on tonight, Saturday, and Sunday. That should basically be a winnable series. Like you can't If you're not winning that series... I have many concerns for the Padres, just because they are loaded, and if the Padres have another collapse, it would kind of be the most San Diego thing for them to happen, unfortunately. That's not being, that's not trying to be mean, but it is basically San Diego. Like, that city is cursed when it comes to San Diego sports. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. (laughs) So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the Padres are hitting the road to Northern California to take on the San Francisco Giants. And then following that series, they have a three-game series at the Chavez Ravine against the Dodgers. Forgot to mention that the Sunday game against the Dodgers and the Padres will be on ESPN. So it's basically game of the week, and I absolutely love it. I don't think there are any other Southern California teams that get game of the week as that's basically the last one for either the Dodgers, Angels, or Padres. It is what it is, though. If the if ESPN can flex them into, I don't know if ESPN can actually flex Sunday night fo- or Sunday night baseball games into prime time. I'm sure they can't, though. It's not like the the NFL and Sunday night football where they could flex teams in and out, but. Eh, what can you do? So that'll do it for the MLB portion of this show. Jump, uh, jumping on over to the WNBA, we don't have much. We don't have anything to talk about outside of the Sparks disappointed me. I'm very sad. I'm very mad, and I'm just disappointed that the Sparks literally did not have the season I was hoping for. My goodness, I am. I am mad. Yep, that's pretty much that for the WNBA. I should also make note that college football is in one week as we get to finally see the new-look USC Trojans and what they're going to bring to the table next Saturday. I really hope that they're able to have success. I don't want to see them disappoint because they they are loaded with talent. Some people are saying that USC won't be able to go deep into the NCAA, or not the NCAA, the FBS playoffs, just because it is, they haven't really been on the field with like a true brotherhood. They haven't really been on the field for a whole lot, which is understandable. I, I get that's a valid argument, but I still am confident that USC can win the Pac-12. Now, national championship could be with, 
a bit of a reach, but you never know with the Trojans. They are saying that they're going to go with Caleb Williams as their quarterback for the game against Rice, but they are keeping Miller Moss, the former Alamany quarterback, in the woodwork, just in case something happens with Caleb Williams. I understand the situation with Caleb Williams, just because it is his senior year, and he's reunited with Lincoln Riley, or he's still with Lincoln Riley. But either way, I think it would be... I think if I had to pick, I'd probably say Caleb Williams, but I hope Caleb Williams does not, like, wet the bed. I think, for me... He's a great quarterback, but so is Miller Moss. Miller Moss can't get the job done. I just think Miller Moss needs some time. And then as for San Diego State, I don't... Obviously, what happened in the news with their punter that's currently on the Bills is an absolute no-no. I'm just hoping that the whole situation gets resolved and the girl can be at peace Either way, I'm not going to get into it just because I don't want to get into it. And if you're looking, Matt, if you're looking, at, if you're wondering what's happening, just look up Matt Ariza, and you'll see him all over the news. Anyway, now for some good news. So UCLA is playing; has its season opener against Bowling Green. If they don't win that one, I'll be disappointed. I also should make note that UCLA is playing an FCS school, meaning that there are only two teams that have not scheduled an FCS opponent. USC, hooray, and Notre Dame. UCLA was amongst those was amongst that club of not scheduling FCS opponents, but now they are. So congratulations UCLA, you have scheduled an FCS opponent. You are no longer part of history. You're now part of history in the worst way. <laughs> I'm kidding. Like it's all it's all for I mean, I understand the whole the whole I, I how do I explain this? The it's I don't want to explain this to the point where I might get a little touchy on a subject, but either way it, it's for like some sort of like all black college university thing again it's just, it's something i don't really want to get touchy about but either way ucla is doing it for their own purposes i'm not going to judge i'm not judge jury and executioner i just talk the sports so there you go anyway so us ucla i don't really expect them to have a true challenge until they play colorado maybe utah i mean washington hasn't really been all that great but what I do want to actually have a segment of, and if I don't have this segment tomorrow on 3 and Out College Edition, I actually am interested of having a five burning questions for the Power 5 conferences. I know UCLA and USC are in the Pac-12, and I know Big Ten, SEC, ACC, and the Big 12 don't have any Southern California teams, but... I would like to have a little segment. That's if I don't talk about it on 3 and Out College Edition tomorrow. But if I'm able to talk about the uh, five burning questions for each Power 5 conference, that's in my opinion. I think that it is going to be fine to have it on this show. So that's going to do it for the brief college football talk. I think it is time we take ourselves a nice little breaky break and basically... Rest my voice for a little bit, and when we come back, we'll be talking some N- not some NCAA. We're going to be talking some MLS as well as some NWSL. As the San Diego Wave, San Diego Wave FC are finally winning, and they actually won a big time game, and I'm happy for them. And I no longer have to hit the panic button. So, looks like I'll be talking about that as well as the MLS. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more. We'll talk a little NHL as well. So keep it locked here. You are listening to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that sports. We'll be right back after this.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Davidson. It's your boy, the entire lot. And we are the hosts of Fast Break here on IE Sports Radio, where we discuss everything in the world of basketball from prep to the pros. You guys definitely check us out, man. Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We got all the basketball information you guys need. So we look forward to you guys listening in. And please do, because we are the best basketball show on this side of the Mississippi. And please do check us out on Twitter at Fast Break ISR. D Lock. Where's our time again? 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. That gives you guys plenty of time on a Sunday. Tune in. College football, and do you want to hear a college football show dedicated to all this college football, including junior college and the Triple CAA and the NJCAA, the NAIA, and the NCAA, including Division Three, Division Two, Division One AA in the FCS, and Division One Single A in the FBS? Well, then look no further. Join myself, Larry B, and my colleagues, Mr. H Town Blake, Blake Henley, and Mr. Christian Espinoza, each week during the college football season for the latest in college football on three and out college edition right here on IE Sports Radio, your directory for all that is sports. Hello ladies and sinners, hello sports fans around the world, hello IE Sports family. This is Cal Henderson, the host of IE Vegas, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. If you folks are interested in sports in the Vegas area, if you're wanting to have a blast for one hour, every Tuesday night from 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, this is a show built for the Vegas sports fans where we feature the Las Vegas Raiders, the Las Vegas Golden Knights, the Las Vegas Aces, and the University of Las Vegas, Nevada Rebels. Hopefully, fingers crossed, MLB team coming soon. Either way, if you folks are looking to have a blast for one hour each and every week, tune in Tuesday, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If you folks are interested in Vegas sports news, Go to our Twitter, at SinCities underscore I-E-S-R, and you can speak with me, the host, Kale Henderson, at Kale underscore Henderson on Twitter. At any time, be happy to reply. Always willing to reach out to our fans. Again, the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Fans, it's your boy Marcus Los Great here to give you what you want, here to give you what you need. Yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live, straight from your mama's basement with a crispy, crispy white tea. <laughs> 
are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome back to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Definitely do listen to all of those amazing shows on our station, such as Gloves Off, Sin City Sports, 3 and Out College Edition, which I'll be on tomorrow, and Fast Break. Def- they are all definitely great shows to listen to. Fast Break covers basketball. 3 and Out College Edition covers college football. Sin City Sports covers... Las Vegas sports, and Gloves Off covers boxing, MMA, combat sports. You get the picture. Back with segment number two of the show, let's get on in to some MLS action. So remember how last week I kind of was fearful of a possible trap game for LAFC? This was one of those moments I hate being right. So unfortunately for LFC, they lost 2-1 to one to the San Jose Quakes. And at first I was a little surprised, but then I was like, oh wait, I forgot I said this was a possible trap game. And I know San Jose and LFC aren't the biggest rivals. It's not like the rivalry that LA Galaxy and LAFC have or Columbus Crew and their rival has, and or Cincinnati FC has, but it's still kind of a good rivalry. I mean, it's SoCal versus NorCal. Like, what what more could you ask for? So anyway, so it's a little disappointing to see LAFC losing. I mean, it, we haven't seen it in a while, but they're still nine points ahead of the second place recipient of the Western Conference. As, unfortunately for LAFC, they got red-carded late in the second half. It was two minutes after San Jose scored, and I'm going to probably pronounce this game. Eli, Eli, Eli Sanchez got a red card two minutes after Kate Cowell scored the t- game, the uh, eventual go-ahead goal. So, yeah, it's very disappointing that LAFC straight up lost, but hey, it's better to lose now than lose when it truly matters. And again, they're nine games ahead of the second place team from the Western Conference, so I don't think they have too much to worry about. It would take a major collapse for them to miss the playoffs. The team that they are facing currently at the moment, however, is Austin FC, which just scored! I'm sorry, I had to basically outbursts like that way, but LAFC is down one nothing to Austin FC. Yeah, I mean, it is being played at Austin, and it is a bummer that LAFC is down, but they still have plenty of time. I mean, they still have 13 more minutes before the second half, and then they have another second half to go, so for LAFC, there is lots of time for them to basically bring it back. A win over Austin FC would basically be a statement win, but losing to San Jose doesn't really do them much favors, so for LAFC, I'd like to see them get back onto the winning track. I think they're setting the tone in the MLS, let alone the Western Conference, And they should be nearing the playoff threshold right about now. Just because they have to be, they have to pretty much be in the playoff, pretty much in the lock zone of the playoffs. Because they're they're 23 points ahead of the 7th place team in the Western Conference. And believe it or not, that 7th place team in the Western Conference just so happens to be the Galaxy, believe it or not. But before we get on into the Galaxy, LAFC actually has another game in Texas on Wednesday against Houston. Now, do I think LAFC is going to be staying in Texas? I don't think so. I don't think they're going to stay just to play the Houston Dynamo. I mean, they'd have to stay Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Now, if it was basically, if they were basically in the bubble, I definitely understand it, but they're not going to stay in Texas. 
So we'll see what happens with the Houston Dynamo versus LAFC. I really think that that should be w- more winnable than it is tonight. Houston is second worst team. Like they're, and LAFC is not the Galaxy. The Galaxy have a legit a laundry list of excuses of why they can't win games. LAFC is just loaded top to bottom. So we'll see what happens when it comes to LAFC and them trying to get back on track. It would be great to see them actually finish atop the Western Conference because they'd get a first round bye. And there's not too many games remaining, in, or not too many matches remaining in the regular season. After tonight, LAFC has only seven matches to go. So it's only a matter of time before they do clinch that spot in the playoffs. They should be, like, so close to it. Like, the mag- their magic number should be basically lit up. Or indicated. So as for the Galaxy, jumping over to the Galaxy... The Galaxy actually tied with Seattle 3-3 last Friday. Yeah, last Friday. And believe it or not, it took a late goal in added time in the second half to basically tie this bad boy up. Because the Galaxy, they struck first when it came to scoring. And they actually led 2-0 at halftime. And then Seattle scored... Not one, not two, but three straight goals from Kellen Rowe, Raul Rui Diaz, and Jordan Morris to go up 3-2. And all was looking lost for the Galaxy. But then, Dejan Hovlicic was basically the hero as he scored that equalizer two minutes into extra time. And thank goodness he was able to score two minutes into extra time because if he didn't, then honestly, it would not be good times for the Galaxy as the Galaxy currently rests in 7th place, whereas Seattle rests in ninth place. Had Seattle won, they would have been in 7th place all by themselves, and they wouldn't even have to deal with Vancouver. So overall for the Galaxy, they, they have a lot of work to do. Starting on Sunday against New England, they are on the road against New England, and then they close out the month of... August against Toronto, that's going to be... Okay, Toronto isn't really the best of teams, Not at least not this year. Toronto and New England... Well, New England's fighting for a spot in the playoffs. Toronto is kind of slacking at the moment. They're basically 11th in the Eastern Conference. So, overall, for, for the Galaxy, eh, they should be able to take care of business just because... You look at the Galaxy's remaining schedule. Those two teams are not in the top seven in their div- in their conference. The first game of September, the Galaxy play Kansas City. That's a team that's not in the top seven of their conference, the Western Conference. Now, the next game after that, Nashville. Nashville is sixth in the Western Conference. Vancouver, on the other hand, is kind of vying for playoff spot. That would be a huge win if the Galaxy were to beat Vancouver. They're basically on the outside looking in as they're still not top eight or top seven, but they're Vancouver's really close. And then the Galaxy play Colorado, which is 11th in the Western Conference. Then San, they play San Jose, which is 12th. And then in October, they play Real Salt Lake, which is... Fifth in the conference, and then they play Houston to close out the regular season, which is dead near last in the Western Conference. So, looking at the Galaxy schedule, it's very winnable. They're playing two teams that are in the top, the top si- seven. They play two teams that are eighth, that are vying for playoff spots, and then the rest of their opponents. There are they have three opponents that are basically not even close to being in playoff contention. So the Galaxy have to make the most of these wins, or the, most of the, they have to make the most of these games, and they have to win the games that they're supposed to win. Only then will they be able to find a way to winning their way into the playoffs. Because once they make the playoffs, it's a whole different ball game. Anything can happen, and that one goal, that one good kick, that one corner kick could be the difference for any team in a game. I'm no soccer expert, but honestly, 
I think the Galaxy, if they make the playoffs, definitely have a good shot at at going deep into the playoffs. It all depends on getting there first. If they do so, then they're golden. But if not, then it's going to be another season of what-ifs. What if the Galaxy actually started winning games when it truly mattered? It's not like last year when they had like a what was it, two-month span or three-month span when they didn't win games. But either way, I just think that the Galaxy need to actually make the playoffs because I'm sick of them missing the playoffs. They have a high standard of making the playoffs, but honestly, the last the last few seasons have been disappointing to say the least. So that is that for the MLS portion of the show. Let's jump on into some NWSL as it's a we have ourselves a huge matchup on our hands as looking back at the LAFC Austin game, LAFC is still down one nothing, which makes me sad. But it's all good because they still have plenty of time left. So to the NWSL, San Diego Wave FC actually won a match. Yes, it took them a while, but they finally beat the Houston Dash, which was a huge win. They won 3-1 at Torero Stadium, and that win has catapulted them into a three-way tie for first place with the Portland Thorns. And believe it or not, Portland finally lost a match as they actually lost to North Carolina, of all teams, the worst team in the NWSL, at least back at the moment. They lost to NW... to... North Carolina 3-1, which, oh my goodness, that was probably the most shocking loss I've ever seen because the last time the Portland Thorns lost a match was against Houston back on May 21st. Fast forward all the way to that match, it had been over a month since North Carolina lost an NWSL NWSL match. We're not counting the matches against Monterey or we're not counting the match against Chelsea. The North Carolina match is is what counts. So, the fact that Portland lost is astounding, especially to that team. So, thank you, North Carolina. What, what's their mascot? Courage? Yes, the North Carolina Courage. Thank you, North Carolina Courage, for doing the Wave FC a solid and beating those pesky Portland Thorns. I'm sorry, but it is I, I, I stand with Wave FC. They could be the first professional team to bring San Diego home a championship. And that would be swell-tastic. Another team that hadn't lost a match in over a month was Houston. And believe it or not, Houston, the last time Houston lost a match was when they lost to Portland when they lost 4 nothing, which was a big fat oof. Actually, no, it wasn't Houston. It wasn't Houston that had that long wing streak. I think it was O.L. Reign, but either way... It's still, there was a team that had another long winning streak, and it wasn't OL Reign. Either way, there was a team that had a long winning streak, and my goodness, this Texas-Ohio State second set is getting good. Man, I'm sorry, but I gotta keep an eye on this Texas-Ohio State women's volleyball match, just because it is so freaking good. It's a top 10 matchup, and I'm basically watching for set point purposes. But enough about volleyball, we're talking about NWSL. So anyway, back to Wave FC. Wave FC has a huge game against, well, I couldn't believe this until I saw it, the Portland Thorns. So this matchup against Portland on Saturday, I want to say. Saturday, yes. Portland and and San Diego are facing one another on Saturday. This is huge. Whoever wins this is going to move closer and closer to getting probably a first round to uh, getting the first round by which is quite nice if they're able to get that first round by that would be huge that's because only the top six teams make the playoffs and if wave gives that gets that first round by that's going to be huge right there just because they get the opportunity of scoping out who they're going to get but they are facing a very talented portland team Obviously, Portland just lost to North Carolina, which was probably the most stunning loss I've seen. But honestly, I would not underestimate Portland. The last time these two teams faced off, well, I'm probably going to get a whole lot of, why do you keep talking about this, Taryn? 
But the last time Portland and San Diego faced off against one another was the VAR, the no VAR game. I swear, if NWSL does not have VAR or instant replay or anything of that sort come this game, I'm going to lose it. I'm still fuming at the fact that San Diego had a goal not even called a goal because of no VAR, no instant replay, no technology in the NWSL, none of that. And that c- I'm still thinking that that could be the game that breaks the cam, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Because if that game just so happens to be the game that costs Wave FC a one or two spot in the NWSL playoffs, I think I'd be fuming if I were the NWSL coach. But looking back at this win over Houston, huge win right there. As believe it or not, Houston actually scored in the. Seventh minute as Ebony Saltman scored to give Houston the one nothing lead. But after that, it was all San Diego as Alex Morgan scored in the 13th minute. Amira Ali scored in the 67th minute. And Sophia Jacobson scored in the 90th minute, just as a little bit of an insurance goal. So it was a good win for San Diego. They definitely needed that win. Just because they lost to Orlando and to Kansas City, though Kansas City is starting to gain steam. I think, yeah, Kansas City, I think, was the team that hadn't lost a match in over a month. So I think Kansas City is going is another team that people need to watch out for. Just because Kansas City, looking at their schedule, they haven't lost a match since they lost to. OL Rain back on May 25th. So, yeah, it's really interesting to see that Kansas City has really picked up steam. It's so amazing, honestly. So, that is, it just takes one possible winning streak to get a team going. And honestly, it's the beauty of the, so- it's the beauty of soccer, honestly. And the fact that they haven't lost in over, in over three months is quite impressive, if you ask me. I don't like it, but it's very impressive. Must be a Kansas City thing. Darn Kansas City Chiefs. Anyway, so back to Wave FC, because they're the biggest priority. Winning over Houston was huge, because they have momentum going into Portland. It is on the road against the Thorns, so winning at Portland is going to be huge. If they're able to win that game, then that is a huge feather in their cap because September has them facing Washington, Angel City, Orlando, and North Carolina. Of those four teams that I just mentioned, Washington currently rests in 11th. Angel City is actually 7th. Orlando is currently 8th. And North Carolina is currently 9th. None of those teams are in the top six. However, that does not mean those are guaranteed wins. Angel City beat Wave FC earlier, and then honestly, I just feel that no game is guaranteed for Wave FC. Now, tying would be would still be good just because a tie would definitely keep them afloat. Tying is better than losing, but winning is better than tying. That's my rule of thumb. So anyway, for Wave FC, they just have to take care of business. If they take care of business, they control their own destiny. And if they control their own destiny, then basically that makes me happy. But if they don't, then it makes making the playoffs a whole lot more tougher. Speaking of teams that make the, want to make the playoffs, Angel City tied with Kansas City 1-1 last week. As the scoring didn't get... The scoring didn't happen until late in the second half as Angel City actually scored courtesy of Kerry Rocaro scoring in the 78th minute. And then Kansas City scored on a penalty kick from Loyal Labonta four minutes after. And eventually that was the game right there. Angel City basically tied with Kansas City, which is impressive. It would have just been better if Angel City had won. Like I said earlier, Angel City is currently 7th in the NWSL standings. They are one point behind Chicago, the Chicago Red Stars. Boy, that was a team that wound up falling from grace quite quickly. I remember Chicago was actually in the top three, and now they're 
clinging to life when it comes to making the playoffs. So we'll see what happens when it comes to them. But overall, I think no playoff spot is guaranteed. I think mainly anyone can make the playoffs. Even Angel City could possibly swoop in. Remember, Kristen Press is out for the season. But don't tell that to Angel City. I think they want to be the team of destiny that doesn't want to give up just yet. Or doesn't want to give up in general. So I look forward to seeing what Angel City has to offer. Their next game is against Gotham. Now, Gotham is currently lost five in a row, and they are currently the worst team in the NWSL. That being said, actually, no, they haven't lost five in a row. They've actually lost six in a row. So they've lost six in a row. So there is no excuse for Angel City to to lose this game. You, you have to not show up in order to lose this game. I really swear if Angel City finds a way to lose to the worst team in MWSL at the moment. Yuck, that was a bad service error. <laughs> Sorry. But if Angel City finds some way to lose to the worst team in the MWSL, they don't deserve the playoffs. I get it. They're, they're down without their best player. But there's no excuse. You have to take care of business. I'm sorry, but that is the truth. If you can't take care of business against the worst team in your league, you don't deserve the playoffs. You just don't. Oh my god, what a great save. I'm sorry. This volleyball is just so freaking amazing. Larry said in the chat room, volleyball is awesome. And this matchup against Texas and Ohio State is just amazing. Texas is up in the second set after they trailed by as many as eight. My goodness. But Ohio State is still clinging on to life of trying to take the second set. So, anyway, <laughs> back to SoCal. Yeah, Angel City, you got to win this game. Please win this. If you don't, then I'm going to be so sad. They are playing in the Big Apple. They're playing in New York slash New Jersey or wherever they're playing at. The Red Bull Arena. So, the last time these two teams actually faced one another, Gotham actually won one nothing. Please, please, please don't don't screw up Angel City. You please just don't lose. I beg of you. You just got to win this matchup, and we will be all relieved, and you will make us all proud, and we'll give you all free whatever you like to eat in California. Just please don't lose. Please. Please! So anyway... Going back to Angel City, before I lose my mind, following the Gotham game, Angel City has only six games remaining against Houston, tough game, North Carolina, should be a win, San Diego, maybe should be a win, but it's also going to be tough, Washington, which is winnable, Louisville, which is winnable, and then Chicago is going to probably be the match that determines who makes the playoffs and who misses out. So we'll see what happens. But overall, Angel City is still in a good position to make the playoffs, but they just have to take care of business in this game. Or match. Either way, that is that for the NWSL portion of the show. Before, well, no, before we get into Dumb Dumb of the Week, we have to go over the Lakers trade as they just traded for Patrick Beverly. So now Patrick Beverly is, I want to say he played for the Lakers. I feel Pat Beverly played for the Lakers. If not, I'm thinking of Lou Williams. But Patrick Beverly, I feel, had had a stint with the Lakers. I feel he was with the Lakers beforehand. And I remember his his story quite well. I remember that he used to play with the Lakers and then, no, I guess he didn't play with the Lakers. I'm think, yeah, I must be thinking of Lou Williams. Cause I remember Lou Williams did have the role with the Lakers where he was good. And then the Lakers were tanking for Lonzo ball at the time. And then Lou Williams was like, no, I don't want to tank. I want to win. So the Lakers shipped him off to Houston, which was incredibly sad and I, I like Lou Williams. I think he's a respectable guy. But Lou Williams, unfortunately, ha- had that moment where he just didn't feel like he wanted to play basketball anymore. But he eventually turned himself around when he was with the Clippers. But going back to Pat Beverly. So Pat Beverly has been with the Miami Heat, the Houston Rockets, the Clippers, and most recently the Minnesota Timberwolves. Now he is a Laker. And here's the thing about that. 
Pat Beverly actually said he wanted to play with LeBron James. If he wanted to play with any superstar, he wanted to play with LeBron James, hands down, without a heartbeat. So everyone and their moms is basically concerned about the bad blood between Patrick Beverly and Russell Westbrook. I say, that's in the past, dude. It's like, if they want to talk about the past, let them talk about the past. But honestly, I don't care if Beverly and... Westbrook had bad blood back in the day. I mean, everyone has to had this bad blood back in the day. So, honestly, I don't I don't care. I really hate how people bring up that narrative. I mean, Kobe and Shaq had bad had bad blood, but then they eventually reconciled and basically they kissed and made up. Also, before I continue, I gotta wish a happy belated birthday to Kobe Bryant and happy belated Mamba Day. Gone but never forgotten. Anyway, back to the Lakers. I think getting Pat Beverly has its pros and cons. Pro, the Lakers get a elite on-ball defender. This dude is basically... He's basically... How, how do I say this? He's an annoying gnat that wants to, like, win you games. When it, Sorry. When he did, played against... When he played on the Clippers and he had to guard LeBron James, LeBron basically couldn't do squat, couldn't do much against Pat Beverly until Pat was subbed out. But I think it's a great get for the Lakers getting Pat Beverly. The cons is they had to give up Stanley Johnson and Talon Horton Tucker, which means now there are only two players remaining on that 2020 championship team where the Lakers won it in the bubble. Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Not even the coaches remaining with them. But either way, as for getting Pat Beverly, I think it's huge. I think that, I think for me, getting Pat Beverly improves the Lakers' defense as that was a category the Lakers struggled with. I think that it's going to benefit them going forward. And I know another con would be Pat Beverly is very old. Well, I wouldn't say very old, but he's kind of up there. I want to say he's like 33, 34, I want to say. But getting Pat Beverly does add veteran experience. Yes, he's 34 years old as he just recently turned 34 back in July. So anyway, for Pat Beverly, I really think that adding him to the fray helps out the Lakers' defense. They were ranked 21st in the NBA last year, and it's quite hideous, if you ask me. I really think it's disgusting that the Lakers were that bad in terms of defense. So, overall, for the Lakers, they got better. I just think that it's still going to be a work in progress. Everyone thinks that them trading Taylor Horton Tucker and Stanley Johnson was a mistake for just Pat Beverly. And everyone is bringing back the whole thing of the Lakers are only going to trade Taylor Horton Tucker for all-star caliber team. Or also all-star caliber players. I think Pat Beverly is considered all-star caliber. Do I think he's not in his prime? Of course not. He's nowhere near his prime. But I really think that Pat Beverly adds a whole lot of a vet of a veteran and defensive presence for the Lakers. And also, hopefully Anthony Davis stays healthy just so we can see him and Pat Beverly on the same court together. Because that's a good little dynamic duo of defensive dynamos. I really would like to see those two on the court. I just don't want to see, like, Anthony Davis injured and then Pat Beverly having to carry the team. So we'll see what happens. Either way, I have mixed feelings for this trade, but I am happy for Pat Beverly coming to the Lakers. I really want to see him do his thing with the Lakers, and I really want to see the Lakers actually become geniuses when it comes to this trade. One person who was not happy when it came to the Lakers trading for Pat Beverly was Marcellus Wiley, and he has every reason to be unhappy just because... Well, for starters, he was a former Clipper, and Marcellus Wiley did like Pat Beverly. I think he was one of Pat Bev's... I think he was one of his favorite Clippers back when he was still with the Clippers, but him going to the Lakers didn't really settle well with the 
with the boy Marcellus Wiley as here's what he had to say on Twitter as he said, loyalty is just a word that begins with a L sad face emoji used to be my homie shrugging of the shoulders emoji used to be my ace cursing emoji. Once a clip, you can't flip face palm emoji. This means war red, white, black, and white, red, blue, black, and white emojis. Hashtag Trader, hashtag Benedict Arnold, hashtag Clip City, Chip City. <laughs> I feel so bad for Marcellus, but I don't really. He's joining the Clippers, and honestly, I think it's really... That's just how business is. I was sad that Phil Rivers eventually went to the Indianapolis Colts and the Chargers didn't bring back his contract. But that's business. Like, the the Chargers were not going to roll with Phil Rivers forever. Like, he was up there in age, and same can be said for, like, Drew Brees. I, w- I wish that we could have seen Drew Brees and LaDainian Tomlinson and all those other talented players on the Chargers win a Super Bowl back in the mid-2000s. Unfortunately, that was not the case, and unfortunately, that was basically that. So, either way, it's just business. NBA is a business, and unfortunately, that's how Pat Bev and the Utah Jazz rolled. So that is that for the NBA portion of the show. We're at an hour and 16 minutes, going on an hour and 17 minutes, as now we got to get into the Dumb Dumb of the Week. So the Dumb Dumb of the Week goes out to an organization or a person that does something really dumb. It's like Shaq and the Fool. Anyone can get it. No one is safe from the Dumb Dumb of the Week award. And I actually have a mini Dumb Dumb of the Week award. So last week I was covering high school football, and to my dismay, I was covering Corona Del Mar and Downey, but I found out Downey was wearing their all-white jerseys. All-white jerseys. I could not see the numbers. Now, I don't know if that's what Downey intended to do, but honestly, as a writer, I could not tell what number who was what number. It was very frustrating. Like, you actually you had to strain your eyes in order to see who scored who is basically who when it came to those jerseys. All white jerseys, all same color everything is a big, fat, hard pass. If you are wearing all color everything, you are basically doing journalists a disservice. Now, obviously, I got to give a shout out to the Downey coaching staff who was basically up calling the plays, and they basically were helping the writers find out who's who. The only person I knew by her by heart was the quarterback, Aiden Childs, who was an Oregon State commit. Other than that, I did not know who anyone was. It was so frustrating. So I'm just going to say this as a public service announcement. Honestly, if you are wearing all color jerseys, like if you're wearing all red or all white or all black or all everything, and I can't read your number, you are going to be put on Dumb Dumb of the Week. I'm not going to give the honor to Downey just because it's not their fault, and it's just high school kids, and it's just the first week, but I swear, it's very frustrating to see all color everything and basically have to strain my eyes and have to even ask for who scored what from the coaching staff because I don't think the coaching staff wants to play who wants to play tour guide of who scored what or who did what or any of that stuff. So to Downey, they get the mini, mini dumb dumb of the week. I don't want to give them any sort of dumb dumb anything. But it's like, you can't do that. For any team out there, please don't make it tough and strenuous for journalists or writers or any of that sort. Please don't like wear all color everything just to the point where the numbers can't be seen. So, Downey, consider this your warning. They just get a warning. So as for the actual Dumb Dumb of the Week, so people do a lot of crazy things in life. Sometimes they eat differently, sometimes they drink differently. Everything is different, but this one is probably the most sickening and disgusting thing I've ever seen. So, as for... This took place at a Yankees game. So, there was this dude, and apparently SportsCenter, or ESPN, caught him in the act, or whoever caught him in the act. 
he was having a beer. Now, there's nothing wrong with a beer. Everyone deserves to crack open a cold one with the boys. And everyone needs like an ice cold brew, especially at a baseball game. But what this man did, he had a straw. But instead of drinking the beer through a straw, he actually had a hot dog. So instead of just eating the hot dog and having the beer, instead, he takes the straw, he makes like a little hole in the little wiener slash sausage, and he makes a full hole, full hole that goes from one part of the dog out the other. And after that, he puts the dog that, he basically made a straw out of a hot dog. He basically made a hot dog straw, and he basically drank the beer through the hot dog straw. I am not kidding you. This man drank beer through a hot dog straw. Ew! Sickening, sickening, disgusting. First of all, who drinks beer through a straw? Second of all, who drinks beer through a sausage, a hot dog? I, 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 oh my goodness. I couldn't believe this. I was just downright infuriated. I was like, what is going on? This is disgusting, sick, gross, all of the above. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Like, this dude was literally drinking beer through a hot dog of all teams. A wiener. Any of that sort. He was drinking wiener... He was drinking a hot dog through a straw. He was drinking beer through a hot dog straw. I just couldn't believe it. I was grossed out about it. It was almost too bad to believe, honestly. But this man, whoever you are, who drank the beer through the hot dog straw, I cannot believe you. You are, first of all, gross. Second of all, you wasted a perfectly good cooked dog. Third, you drank beer through a straw. You don't drink beer through a straw unless you have a dental surgery or any of that sort. And fourth... All of the above. I am absolutely sickened by this. Beer drinkers should be sickened by this. And you wasted a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful cooked dog. And for that, for all of that I just said about you drinking the hot, the beer through the hot dog that you create through a straw, you are this week's Dumb Dumb of the Week Award recipient. So dumb. You are really dumb. For real. <laughs> And that, my friends, is all she wrote. Drinking beer through a hot dog. Just the dog. Hard pass on that. I wouldn't do it even if I was on offered like... Okay, maybe I would do it if I was offered like a, a lump sum of money. But still... I wouldn't do it if my life, if I was, like, given, if my life was on the line. Like, I just would not do it. It's just gross, dude. It's really, really gross. Like, it's just bad, dude. I'm sorry. You wasted a beer, and you also wasted a perfectly good cooked dog. But on that note, that is going to do it for this week's episode of the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time to get on out of here. Because i got to get me some dinner and I've got me some more volleyball to watch. Yeah, dig? Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for tuning in to the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. I really do appreciate everybody tuning in. If you listen live, I appreciate you. If you listen on the playback, I appreciate you. If you listen at work, I appreciate you. If you listen at any time, any place, anywhere, I really, really do appreciate you. Big shout out to my boy Larry B in the chat room. It really means a lot that you were in there for the first half of the show. I will be with him on 3 and Out College Edition tomorrow at 7 a.m. Pacific Time. Definitely do keep an eye out for that. It is going to be Season 3, I want to say, of College Edition. Maybe Season 2. But either way, I'm excited for College Edition to return. You should be too. I will be talking high school football as well, because that's what's been going on. And we'll also be previewing some college football as well throughout the Power 5 conferences, and then some. For everyone here at IE Sports Radio, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. 
You all have yourself an amazing weekend. Enjoy the sports that's been happening. Eat. I wouldn't say it's still sunburn season, but do keep applying your sunscreen just because you never know what could happen. And that sun is still plenty hot. I will see you all Monday for Set Point. But until then, you'll have yourself a great rest of the weekend. You all stay safe. Stay out of trouble. Don't do anything dumb or you'll be on Dumb Dumb of the Week. And just remember one thing. SoCal is for SoCal. Talk to you later, everybody. Peace!